Mm. There you go. So whenever you're ready. Hello, I'm Bill Bracken. I'm the founder and culinary director of Bracken's Kitchen, a community impact nonprofit hunger relief organization here in Orange County. Bill and I met, uh, thanks Bill. It's great to, great to have you. I, there are some people in my life when I just don't remember not knowing them. And I know we didn't meet that long ago, but I've known who you are for a long time. I think where you came onto my radar in person was last year when you were honored through, through the Passkeys Foundation. Uh, and you gave just an amazing, uh, I'll call it a speech for lack of a better term, but you talked about Bracken's Kitchen and your mission and what you do. So I'm going to just tell our audience a little bit about you and what you do. Bracken's Kitchen is a 501c3 organization based here in Orange County, California, founded in 2013. Their mission is simple. Through food recovery, culinary training, and community feeding programs, they are committed to recovering and repurposing and restoring both food and lives. I love that. I watched a video in my in my stocking, or I'll call preparing for this interview. <laughs> I watched a little YouTube video where you took us on a tour, and I love where you, how you talk about we nourish people, we don't feed them. Tell me what the difference is to you on that. Well, you know, uh, um, somewhere along the line, uh, someone, one of our volunteers in early, early days said that we're delivering hope one tasty meal at a time. And we learned a long time ago that um, food is just a conduit that we've been given to reach people. Obviously, we feed people. It's what we do. There's so much hunger in Orange County and all over America. But if people are struggling to put a meal on the table, you can be uh, darn sure that they're struggling in so many other areas. So from the very beginning, uh, when I knew I was being called to feed people, we set out to do it differently, to truly to uh, spend time with them, not just hand out a meal, good luck, bye-bye, brown bag with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, in, but to come out with a food truck to feed them, to put on an event. Uh, you know, we always insist if we were out with the food truck, there's tables and chairs to set up, that there's music playing and a good meal and let them escape life, even for just an hour, to really nourish their body, their soul, and to give them a little bit of hope for something better tomorrow. How do people find you and how do you find them? I'm not end of the end of the interview. We'll talk about what's your social and how do people reach yeah, you and get yeah. involved. And we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll, we'll table that, you know, pun okay. intended, but how do people find Bracken's kitchen and what you do and how do you find them? Well, um, you know, we early on when we started Bracken's kitchen, I didn't have much of a budget. <laughs> I was unemployed <laughs> at the time and I was, you know, funding this myself and what well, we did have was social media and um, we worked really hard to pour into that just to raise awareness and, you know, like you said, we'd been on, uh, like you'd been on my radar screen for a long time. You'd heard about us. So, um, you know, uh, we have a lot of agency partners that we work with. Over 45 right now that get meals from us that we connect with, uh, go out with at the food truck and feed still. And they are really our conduit um, to feeding people. From the very beginning, I knew I didn't want to have to go out looking for people who are hungry. I didn't ever want to have to qualify a person's need. So we just came alongside other well-known nonprofits who are we already pri uh, providing a multitude of services, to food just not being one of them. And it's just truly been kind of our, our way of reaching out to community. We just started a culinary training program and we work with all these agency partners that help, help us with our students. So it really is through um, the village that it takes, as we know. Now, not to age you because you put this in your bio or whoever wrote your bio did, but I'm just going to use the number because it's out there. <laughs> 35 year career in the luxury hospitality industry. So how did you... In the, I'm curious, I'm sure that over the, knowing you the way I'm getting to know you, I'm sure that the idea, even though you launched in 2013, probably hit you in the 90s or probably hit you in the early 2000s, like, like most good efforts. The idea was there for a while. When did this go from an idea to now fast forward to 2013 and it's a reality? Talk us, talk us through that process. Absolutely. And uh, I'm glad you got the older version of my bio. It only <laughs> says 35, only 35 years. Yeah, there you go. There there's you. a few more behind now, but uh, All good. we won't talk about that right now uh, with the big birthday coming up in, a, in about, a few yeah, days. We're both approaching a big day here, I think. <laughs> yeah. so, so. Um, you know, uh, Ed, as I look back, I realize my whole life has been uh, just on a path to where I am here and where I grew up in small town America. We just looked out after each other. My grandma, one of my grandmothers always had a, a pie in the bottom left side of her refrigerator that uh, I learned uh, very early on, don't ever touch that pie. Mm -hmm. Grandma, This grandma didn't cook a lot. The other grandma was an amazing cook. Uh, uh, but this grandma always had pies. And back then the train came through town 
uh, stopped at the little train depot uh, in, in town before the trains went away. And there was always, you know, what you call hobo riding the trains across the country. And my grandma would always go down there and take a pie and feed people. So, you know, this is just an example. My my other grandma uh, comes from a very rural area. and They would literally give, if they had one chicken left in the chicken pen, it would have been dinner at night. They would give that to feed somebody else. And um, this is just the world I grew up in. And, you know, I got lost along the way in the, the, the luxury world of uh, five-star, five-diamond hotels and feeding the rich and famous. But in, you know, 2008, uh, we're both old enough that we can remember when that economy t- tanked and the housing mar- market went in the toilet. And I watched a lot of really good friends lose their job when there was no jobs out there. And I watched him struggle. And uh, to me, the face of hunger was always that person on the side of the freeway with the sign hungry, well, you know, we'll, we'll work for food or something. And, yeah. and the face of hunger for me changed right in front of me. Friends of mine who had no job, had no prospect of a job. They maybe had a house or a mortgage. They had a wife, young kids at home, and they couldn't even put a meal on their table. And that was then that I was first, you know, felt that I was being called to feed people, you know, and you know, as time went on, I, I did like many, many people did during that time that just put your head down and work really hard. And, you know, especially in the hospitality industry and hotels, because, uh, tourism just dropped off completely uh, events travel banquets uh, businesses weren't putting on big fancy holly christmas parties and things i mean the world changed for us in 2008 and uh, i just put my head down to not end up on the chopping block and then in the 2011 the inevitable happened inevitable and i was thrust into the lines of men employed and uh, I, I knew then that was god doing for me what i could do for myself and that was truly my call uh, to feed people. There's so much more to the story, but I won't bore everybody with all the details, no, that's, but this is, that's really got me going. <laughs> this is the Bill Bracken hour. People are listening today because they want to hear your story. Thank you. You're too kind. What do you love? Let me, let me first, let, let's, we'll get into Bracken's kitchen here in a second on the same question, but as a chef, what is it about being a chef? I've read that. And you even just said it, you felt called to it. What I, I, I watch all the cooking channels. I love Guy Fieri. I'm fascinated by, restaurants and by what you do i have no talent for it whatsoever just like music i love music but i can't i can sing a little but i can't play an instrument um what is it about being a chef that you love so much well you know i don't know apart, that I apart truly... from what you're doing at bracken's kitchen we'll go there oh, no, I got just you, your, but I, yeah just your talent I, i'm gonna i'm gonna clarify it for a minute because um I learned a long time ago that there's a lot of really really amazing cooks out there that but they don't all become great chefs because being a chef is so much more than cooking. It is running a, a kitchen, running, mm-hmm. running a brigade. So I don't know that I ever love being a chef because <laughs> that's, that's running a there business. Yeah. But the cooking part of it, um, you know, I, I stumbled into cooking at home when I was, um, I don't know, 10 years old and mom had went back to work. I was the youngest of four kids. Dad worked and uh, I just, I started cooking to feed myself because I was hungry. I was mm-hmm. home and, you know, my, my greatest joy as I got a little bit older will, will probably shock you because, I mean, we grew up with a garden where we grew all of our own produce and it was canned or frozen and put in a root cellar. People don't know what root cellars are in California, but your know, grandma had right? the underground cellar. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the potatoes and the apples and the hard vegetables went into the root cellar on the ground for the winter. Dad worked in a meat packing plant. So everything at home was all made from scratch, home cooked. And, um, You know, when I got a little older, I could drive my bike around town Um, in the summer, especially I'd pick up pop bottles, actually known as soda bottles in California glass bottles. And uh, we didn't recycle them back then. They turned them in for five cents. And I believe they cleaned them, sterilized them and reused them back in the day. But five soda bottles or pop bottles would give me a quarter. The quarter I can go to the local grocery store and I can buy a can of Chef Boyardee spaghettios because we never had those at home and so that was almost how i started cooking and i could buy a tv dinner for 30 cents and pop it in the oven or even before microwaves and uh because again that was something we never had at home and some of my friends always had those convenience foods and you know that i graduated into cooking and and everything and along the way i learned that not only did i have a talent for it and a skill for it but i actually really enjoyed it and you know um cooking if you truly are a an artist of the trade, if you will, it is, it's an art form and it's a way to express yourself um, on a plate with food. And um, I mean, we all share 
the two most basic human needs for survival, the need to breathe, the need to eat. And at Bracken's Kitchen, we say the problem is air is free and food is not. But that fact gives food so much power over a person's life. And whether you're an A-list celebrity that I fed in Beverly Hills who's freaking out about the way his oatmeal is made or someone who doesn't know where the meal is coming from, food is a powerful, powerful thing in a person's life because we need it to survive. And you know, when you're cooking and you're not only satisfying someone's um, desires to, for a great meal, but also satisfying their need to just eat. It is, there's something, uh, it's hard to even describe, but there's something deeply rewarding for people who really appreciate that. And, you know, at the same time, you get to be creative, you get to be artistic. I, I need a creative outlet, whether it's working on something in my backyard or working on something in the kitchen. So, uh, and, and depending on who you are and where you're from, uh, food becomes your artistic outlet as a chef. Are you the one that cooks at home? Uh, not much anymore, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Molly, uh, Molly's come a long ways that we joke and call her the one pot wonder because she can do amazing things. She's finally, after all these years of, uh, of uh, life with me, she's learned to not have to follow a recipe and just cre get creative and cook and I, I joke when I say that because I remember the day that my mother realized that as a chef, I didn't open a cookbook and make a recipe from a book. And I mean, yeah. I was a chef to cuisine with Four Seasons at the time. And she's like, you mean you don't have a recipe that you follow? No, mom, I'm the recipe. You know, it's just you like, know. it's just a, it's a whole other world, you know. And everything's slightly different every time because you might put a little bit more of something in and a little yeah. bit less of something else the next time. Exactly. That's awesome. Yeah, like I said, I'm fascinated by that. I'll watch all the cooking shows. I'm excited to share this interview with my daughter-in-law, Maddie, who got me turned in, turned on to all of these different cooking shows. And she's, <laughs> she'll, she can cook anything. And it's really fun when we go visit them up in Utah. You know, uh, she, she, she's, she's not a chef. I guess she is. She's got four kids that report to her and, and my son. So, you know, I guess in a way she's a chef yeah. in the household. But yeah, you ever watch Hell's Kitchen? A little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, that was the world I grew up in. <laughs> yeah, nice. I love it's, it. It's a whole other world, that's for sure. So, yeah, that's awesome. Do you have any? Do you have uh, those celebrity chefs, if you will, or any that you look up to that you, you know, that's kind of the guru in your industry that you you admire or learn from? You know, years ago, uh, I loved Dean Faring, still do. I don't know that he would call me his friend anymore. I haven't seen him for so many years, but he's famous in Texas, Southwestern cuisine, and. You know, I have uh, countless over here on the side that you can see behind. I got countless cookbooks. And for years, I bought the latest chef's cookbook. And I never, ever, ever looked at a recipe, only pictures, because I needed creative ideas. Dean Faring is the only chef who I ever actually used recipes from his cookbook, um, because he just did amazing things. And, um, you know, I'm, um, I don't know if the word is a purist, um, coming from the Midwest, I never got into a lot of the molecular gastronomy and some of the things, but uh, Dean, I loved his creativity. I did, I did a lot of things with Wolfgang Puck in LA over the years. And he was, uh, I mean, just great people with great personalities and great hearts and, and great in the kitchen as well. So to me, there's a lot more to being a great chef, like I said, than just being able to cook. So, uh, uh, so yeah, those people that, uh, those chefs who have been successful have a heart for doing something or giving back and um, and just good human beings to me was always important. What's your comfort food, whether you make it or you go get it? I, um, if I had a magic genie bottle or something, I can rub it and I could have three wishes. One of them would be my mother's fried chicken one more time. You know, she passed away a few years ago and she made pan fried chicken with gravy and mashed potatoes. Um, uh, really, really, really good fried chicken would, would be my first go-to thing all the time. And not KFC, anything like that there, but there's a great place in Kansas City called Stroud's. And if you go into the original place, there's about eight or nine stoves there and they're just completely covered with cast iron skillets and they're full of fried chicken going all day long. It's just real authentic pan fried chicken. So we're recording this at 1240 on a Friday afternoon and I haven't had lunch yet. So I haven't either, by the there, way. There so. might be chicken on, in my near future today, maybe for the rest of you listening as well. So I want to talk to you about the three part uh, aspects of Bracken's Kitchen one at a time. So talk to me what, you know, you're touching on it already, but when you hear the term or you create the term a community feeding program, talk about that. Then we'll get into the, the rescued food portion and then the culinary training portion. 
Absolutely. I mean, you know, as we grew, I, mean, I started out with the food truck feeding people Ed. Betsy. How did the name Betsy come along for that food truck? Uh, it's kind of funny. I mean, I, a little bit of history. I was out of work, unemployed, doing consulting, trying to feed my family. My wife hadn't been working at the time. Knew I was being called to feed people, trying to figure it out. I never was big a, a big coffee drinker, but Starbucks became my home because I no longer had an office and a hotel to go to. So, And they had free and, Wi-Fi. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, I built this idea for a concept, uh, a completely different name. Uh, and it was kind of a for-profit ref- restaurant that morphed into feeding people at the same time. Um, and I just knew for many reasons that wasn't going to work. I couldn't put a restaurant in South Coast Plaza area and put a nice for-profit restaurant. By the way, on Thursday nights, we're open up for homeless people to show up and eat. I mean, awesome. you know, it just it wasn't going to work. Um and I sent Starbucks one day and a food truck went by and just the light bulbs went off. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get a food truck and bring food to the people wherever they are. Uh, low income communities, homeless, whatever it was. In the beginning, I didn't even want to feed homeless people. I was afraid of them. And I wanted to stay away from that. Um, but uh, 2014, we were incorporated and we're trying to get it off the ground. I started fundraising uh, to buy a food truck. Um, did the ice bucket challenge before ALS took over. Um, and suddenly toward the end of the year, I was donated Betsy, our first food truck. And it's a red food truck from Bruce's Catering. Wow. He does motion picture catering. Betsy used to be on the set of Grey's Anatomy, The Walking Dead, all these Hollywood shows. Like I, she used to feed the rich and famous. There and you go. Bruce, Bruce wanted to donate her to me. And all I knew was a red food truck. And the day we were up there in Paramount City picking her up, um, he was kind of got a little emotional there. was saying goodbye to Betsy. I'm like, what, Betsy? So I, I know this is off the top of your question, but I think no, I it's a it. crazy, funny story. But uh, uh, it's a rainy day, one of those seldom rainy days in California, and I'm driving a food truck for the first time in my life. Wow. I'm coming down the 101 freeway, and every creak, every sound in the food truck, what's that? What's that? I'm <laughs> what's like, that it, noise? Uh, it's scaring the you know what out of me. I'm thinking mm-hmm. it's falling apart. And the last thing I should have been doing was um, on my phone. But there I am sitting in traffic. So I, I make a quick video, selfie video of, to my wife and post on Facebook that, hey, honey, I love you, but I hope it's okay. There's a new woman in my life and her name is Betsy. Nice. And and Betsy just became part of the family. And um, and that's why everything now in this building has a, a, every vehicle has a name with B. There's a name behind every one of them. Burp the truck, blew the van, Babs the new food truck. There's a story behind them. We just stuck with the bees. It worked well because I'm a Bill and a Brock. And so. Yeah, exactly. You got two bees in your name, so that's perfect. And the color was red, and that worked well, too. I didn't choose red. Betsy was already red, and I'm a Chiefs fan, so that worked well. Perfect. Um, but that was our community feeding program in the beginning, um, me just going out in the community and feeding people and uh, didn't call it that. But as we grew and we realized all these other needs and as we landed on a trio of service and we had to call this something and it's community feeding we're out feeding in the community whether we're providing meals to uh someone uh through our food truck whether we're providing to another agency whether uh another nonprofit is picking up a hot lunch today like uh the hub got it today and miracles for kids and higher ground all picked up hot lunches there. that's community feeding that's just out there doing what we do what was the impact of covid from 2020 through the 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 peak times. I mean, I know, you know, wing lamb and what he did with the California love drop and is still yeah. doing. And, and obviously what Bruno's doing over the white house and has done for years. I'm sure you've got a relationship with both of yep. those guys. Um, talk about the impact on the community feeding when there was even a bigger need in a more isolated and specific way during COVID. Absolutely. I mean, we all have those things in our life, those moments in our life that we'll never, ever forget. Uh, I remember driving home Friday March 13th. No one ever talks about it. It was Friday the 13th. I know, right? Yeah. Go figure. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's when the governor closed down California. Yep. Um, remember it well. And I remember, one of those I'm, moments where we all remember yeah. where we were. I mean, it's like 9-11, those things. And it was the eeriest feeling. I don't know if the streets were any different than any other day, but mostly it felt like the place was abandoned. Like, like an abandoned I don't know. Like, uh, yeah. Um, but we had a meeting. We only were seven employees at that time. Our goal in 2020 was 600,000 meals. Uh, we were still fairly new in this kitchen. That had just been a little over a year getting settled in. And we had a meeting with the managers and like, what are we going to do? No one knew what was going to happen with COVID. Uh, 
we knew that we had to get rid of volunteers and suspend that program. But do we, uh, do we just close down at that point in time? We we're feeding uh, a group of people at one or two shelters. Do we just cut back to a bare minimum and feed those shelter clients? Because the whole week long, um, we watched all these people uh, stand up for kids. Um, I don't remember all the organizations we even worked with back then, but all these people that were picking up hot meals all week long, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every day we're getting phone calls for cancel. We don't need food. We don't need food. We don't need food. So we're like, what do we do? Do we just pull way back and ride out the storm for a few weeks or what? And I send everybody home to think about it, pray about it. If you're a praying person, what are we doing? Everybody came back on Monday and unanimous. It's like, no, we're here for a reason. God's got us here. We need to, to ramp up because there's going to be need. And we had no idea what COVID had in store for us. And none of us did. And, uh, you know, we went from 600,000 meals was our goal in 2020 to 1.75 million meals, you know, three times the amount. We completely revamped everything we did. Um, and, uh, you know, we hired 16 people that were out of work in the restaurant business to, since we didn't have volunteers. And, you know, we, as we look back that we had a five-year plan um, and that was year two. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the end of year two and a half to two and a half, we had hit our five-year goal. Yeah. <laughs> so it just, COVID got us there a whole lot quicker. And, you know, since then we worked really hard to maintain that, that growth and progress and continue to look forward. But it was, it was, um, I hard, it's hard for me to, to speak at that time in a positive manner because there was so much hurt and pain and people died and right. people struggling and out of work. It was such a terrible time, but it was transformational for us. And it forced us to do things we wanted to do, but we just didn't know how to do it. And we were able to do that because we're in just this amazing, amazing community called Orange County and everybody stepped up in amazing ways. I mean, companies that were closed, but they had trucks, they stepped up with drivers to pick up and deliver and go here and go there. And, organizations donated to us financially. I mean, how can we help? I mean, connecting people just, I mean, that's a beautiful thing of Orange County here it really is. Something I've paid close attention to in my career, especially in working with family owned companies like I've done over the last two decades. And I'm going to make a broad brush statement here, but I really think it's true based on my experience is what 2020 did is it made those companies that weren't really philanthropically focused and weren't really outwardly focused on their communities. It kind of brought them to a screeching halt. And many yeah. shut down because they just didn't know where to go. Yeah. While the Bracken's Kitchens and the Advanced Beauty Colleges and the Wahoo's Fish Tacos and the Antis Roofings and the others of the world, all folks you know, it, it escalated their business and all of your businesses yeah. just ramped up. Like you said, yeah. your five-year plan of, you know, we're going to do 600 plus thousand meals this year. You did 1.2 million. Um, I saw that too. I mean, I've asked the question of guests before, and I won't put you on the spot with this question, but a question that I've talked with people over podcasts and over lunch with is if you had a switch, an imaginary switch on uh, March 13th, you set the date, March 13th, 2020, and you're going to flip that switch and everything that's going to happen over the next two to three years is going to happen or none of it's going to happen. If you don't flip the switch, it's hard to imagine flipping the switch because of all the horrible that happened, but man, the growth that took place, your growth, your company growth, the impact you've had, you know, for me personally, the stuff that I was able to accomplish in 2020 through now, no way in the world would have I accomplish those things had COVID not happened. So do I look at it as overall as a blessing? No, but do I look that we found the blessings in it, of course. Yeah. And that sounds like, you know, we find, well, the, we find the calms and the storms. I think I appreciate that, Ed. And I will answer the question. I probably would have said no, because yeah. uh, I mean, fear and the unknown and everything i mean uh i mean i'll always be honest no matter what and uh, i i'll never like yeah i'm so brave i would do this no matter what i know people that would take a risk like that and they would yeah. lose it all tomorrow and walk wake up and do it all over again and there's a world of amazing people out there that would do that that's not me right i mean i was i was forced to i remember in my kitchen at home making a video uh, as we were going through this and again all we had was social media and everybody's at home now because there's no place to even go to work. So social media became even more powerful. I remember standing there in front of my stove, making a video, holding a basketball <laughs> and, and, and talking about the concept of pivoting on the basketball court. The only way you can move forward once you stop dribbling is to pivot and try to pass the ball. And that's what we were doing, pivoting in a way I never would have imagined. And here I am trying to be creative. And here's what a pivot looks like in basketball. And here's what it looks like in Bracken's kitchen. But yeah, I mean, I don't think in a million years I would have made that decision if I had the choice because 
oh my gosh, the fear of the unknown and everything that goes along with it. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. So community feeding program, and let's talk a little bit now about the rescued food, rescued food. I can talk rescued food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Occupational hazard you. of a podcast host is <laughs> I can't talk. Yeah. Rescuing food. Talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, a good friend of mine who's one of our board members started a program called Chef in Hunger when he was with LA Specialty Produce. It's now best uh, this nonprofit program still works. And he started about the same time, maybe six months before Bracken's Kitchen was born. And they started working on rescuing um, over-prepared, uh, uh, over-prepped food from hotels and restaurants. They put an amazing program together to make it simple for their customers to take their leftover food and, and donate it. And when I started Brack Bracken's Kitchen, the last thing I ever thought of was rescued food. Um, I was calling all these vendors that I've been purchasing from for the last 25 years and saying, hey, you got to donate to me. You got to do something. I need food to feed people. And I'm not going to pay uh, premier cost for it. And they all they all stepped up. But then, you know, the USDA come out with this report that up to 40 percent of our food supply is landing in the uh, landfill. Um, well, you know, at that time, 12 and a half percent of America was going hungry. And mm. I, 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 this became a kind of a mantra a speech of mine for a long time when we get it, got into this. And I would tell the statistics and I'd, I'd tell people, guys, I'm, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not the smartest guy even on this podcast, Ed. Mm. But, but I know, if we're, uh, I know if we're um, using 60 to 65 percent of our food supply to feed 88 percent of America, just think what we can do with the other uh, 12 percent of the population is hungry if we just stop throwing away 35 percent of the food. So I was really kind of forced into this world of rescued food and um, we embraced it early on. It was nothing but uh, rescued food from the chefs in hunger program, leftovers from hotels and restaurants. And I was blessed to have a great relationship with the people and still do it best. And I said, guys, if you give me rescued leftover food, I want it from the Hotel Bel Air. I want it from Wolfgang Park. I want it from Terranea Resort. I want, because they knew where it was coming from. I only want the best rescued food I could get. Right. I mean, come on, I'm a five-star, five-diamond chef. So <laughs> don't give me the leftover sandwiches from some sandwich shop down the road. Um, and every Tuesday was uh, was uh, Chef Didn't Hunger Day at the kitchen, back when we had a shared kitchen. And our, our chief operating officer, Kat Richards, was a volunteer at the time. George is still a volunteer. Sylvia, they were all my volunteers on Tuesday. And we went through cases and all these pans and opened it up. And everybody was like, it's like the biggest episode of Chop then. It's like their kid in candy store. What's in this pan? What's in that pan? And you'd open it up and it's it's all leftover lobster from a banquet. I mean, I remember one time we got like six cases of all leftover lamb chops. Actually, it was venison chops. Let me correct you. Correct myself. And I know exactly what happened there because I've been in that world. Somebody in some uh, company decided to get creative in a banquet and they're going to give them a choice of venison and chicken. 90% mm -hmm. of them say, I'll take the chicken because I, I don't know what venison is. So um, we had a lot of venison left over. We mm -hmm. chopped it up. We made a beautiful stew with it. We went out and fed people. We didn't want them to know that it was venison. Um, so we called it hunter stew. You know, because I could picture some little kid, Bambi, you're eating Bambi yeah, or something like that. Right, so, right. Um, but that was the beginning of it. Today, um, you know, Newport Meat Company is one of the bigger suppliers. They are the, well, the premier meat company on the West Coast of the United States. They send their, their beef as far away as the Middle East, Abu Dhabi and places like that. And like any grocery store, like at home, if you got a fresh product, if you don't eat it, you got to throw it in the freezer. It's going gonna, it's gonna to end up in the trash. And, you know, so... No matter how well you manage your inventory, you got product that's not moving. You can't you can't control what people are going to order. And pro products been in the refrigerator too long. They didn't sell it. Whether it's chicken, beef, lamb, they throw it in the freezer. They build up donation pallets, and every couple of months we get six or seven pallets of meat. And wow. I mean, I have one huge bone-in Kobe strip loin from Snake River Farms that it's now just a sample. We'll never cut it up and use it, but it's a sample of this this piece of meat that would have sold for $35, $40 a pound didn't get sold. Um, and I, you know, it's, 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 it's our rescued food program has really been transformative for us because we went from leftover cooked food and 
uh, from hotels and restaurants to large volume product. We just picked up 1,200 pounds of uh, fully cooked sliced turkey from a local school district. They'll remain nameless, so no one will be complaining. But someone obvi obviously ordered way too much turkey for the school, and summer summer's here now, and they can't use it. So right. we picked it up, and we'll we'll make sandwiches with it. We'll throw it into turkey pot pie and do amazing things. So it really has just changed drastically. And and I will say this, Ed. Um, uh, you know, I'm. Uh, I we get all sorts of uh, feedback and advice and guidance and comments from people like anybody. That if you're any type, if you're in any type of public uh, place, um, you know, people will see us using plastic, and how dare you use plastic to serve in? It's not good for the environment. Well, we're not using foam. Plastic can be recycled. Then there'll be someone who's a, a, a vegetarian, and they're believe in animal rights, and how dare you? you know, use this and that. And, you know, I'm a country boy from Kansas. I'm a meat and potato boy. Give me my steak and potatoes. Yep. Uh, I have no problem with that. But I feel as a people, as a human race, we have an awesome res moral responsibility. If we're going to take the life of an animal, we have a moral responsibility to make sure we use it for its intended purpose to exactly. feed people. Yeah. To, to, to slaughter an animal and then throw 40% of it away, you know, we just... A month ago, we cooked. Wall. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we a month or so ago, we cooked off a whole pig that came to us. Not even a portion of it, a whole pig. We cooked it in a smoker and we pulled all the meat off of it and used some of it for some meals. And we fed our staff and then had a little bit of fun. But here's a, a pig that was yeah. slaughtered to feed people and to just throw it away. So the rescue food program is truly transformative. And we, we have a res as a responsibility, I think, as human beings to to not throw so much food away when so many people are hungry, especially. Oh, I look at just what what's wasted in, in just the homes, you know, I mean, not admitting anything here, but how often do we buy meat or, or, or veggies or fruit and we don't end up using it because maybe we went, we went out more or we just, for what happens reason, to us too, all yeah, of us, it's happened. All, yeah. I've thrown yeah. away more vegetables than I've eaten. And that's a sign <laughs> of that. I don't eat a lot of vegetables, <laughs> but I definitely probably thrown away more veggies than I've eaten. Well, me too, but my wife buys a lot more too than she probably should. And it's usually the, zucchini, or the cucumber at the bottom of the tray that you didn't know was down there and you get down there. Oh, oh, how long oh, has it been there? there? <laughs> That's what that smell is, right? Awesome. So the third leg of the stool between, so you got the community feeding program. We've talked a lot about the rescued food program. I love what you're doing in culinary training. And that video that I watched on YouTube last night in prep for this, among other things that I did, um, there was a gentleman in the video. I don't know when you shot the video, but um, that was there being trained for a, a, a profession in the culinary arts. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the culinary training aspect of the business or of, of the well, um, organization. If you'll allow me, I'm going to tell you a little God story that led, led to this, if I Please. may. Um, um, it was 2015. It was me and Betsy feeding, going out every Tuesday night to Ross Street House. Um, I wasn't even making a salary at Bracken's Kitchen because I never thought this was going to be my full-time thing, but that's a story for another time. Um, and I was in a, I was in a dark place in my life. I mean, uh, I was, I cooked for Sylvester Stallone and Tom Cruise and presidents and movie stars. Hulk Hogan used to call me every time he came to town at the peninsula. I had his cell number and wondered, Hey brother, I'm coming to town, man. I need four old chickens for dinner. To, I mean, uh, you know, Hulk like Hogan, him. man. Yeah, there you go. Hulk <laughs> maniacs. Uh, but I mean, I, this is what's my life. And here I am out feeding homeless and low-income population in Santa Ana and, and the likes. And my wife was uh, became the sole breadwinner. Financially, we were really struggling. And it was just really hard for me. And I was in a really bad spot. And did I just blow up my career because it had been a year and a half of this? And while I've been doing some consulting on the side, I, I left that world. And did I make a mistake? And What's, what's, where, where am I at? I mean, I was in a really bad spot and I got called or tasked to uh, help out with Stand Down Orange County, which was a big event for homeless veterans. And uh, due to politics involved and things like that, there are a lot of uh, agencies that were going to be part of it pulled out and suddenly me coordinating the food service, it became me providing the food service. So for Two, three weeks, I don't remember exactly now, I suspended our food truck feeding program at Bracken's Kitchen so I could focus full-time on feeding 
a thousand military veterans breakfast, lunch, and dinner for three days at the uh, old blimp hangars at the old uh, uh, Tustin Marine Base. Sure. And as I was gone and not feeding everything, I just I spent a lot of time praying, God, I, I need to know, am, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I in the right place? I mean, the, I mean, I started thinking about all these kids that I knew at Ross Street House. They all called me Uncle Bill. I always joke, I'm the only wetto white boy Uncle Bill ever know. Um, right. But do they even know I'm gone? I mean, okay, where's the guy at the food truck? Am I having an impact on their life? I mean, I know they enjoyed the meals, but our, our philosophy then was if we can provide a meal one or two days a week for this, you know, really low impop, income population, they could save their money uh, to pay for rent and all these other things. Am I having an impact? I just, I didn't know. And I mean, I'm deep inside, I knew, but I was in such a dark space because I gave up this career. Of this some sort, yeah. sure. um, so I just prayed over and over again, God, please tell me, show me. Uh, when I come back to Ross Street, I need to know something. So Tuesday, every Tuesday we went there. And Ross Street, the house was a half a mile north of the Civic Center in Santa Ana, where at that point in time, 470 homeless people were living in the court of the flag. I'm sure you remember that period. Yeah. Um, but um, I pulled into Ross Street house in the old food truck, noisy old thing. Uh, you remember the one squeaking down the freeway yeah, I talked about earlier. Yeah. <laughs> and I, as I you know, put it in neutral and went to back into my spot. I can, the kids were all over there having their afternoon snack. Um, and they're making a lot of noise, but they always make a lot of noise, but it seemed different. I backed Betsy up. I backed into the spot and it just got louder and louder. Um, hmm. but I put Betsy in park and I uh, turned off the engine and then I, I heard what was going on. There were 45 Hispanic kids over there chanting Uncle Bill, Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill. And uh, I was just like, oh, my God. I mean, I needed a sign. I didn't even get out of the truck yet. God, give me, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, give me a break here. I started crying and I'm like, OK, thank you, God. Um, I composed myself. I got out. I went over there and they all got up and they were around me. And I felt like Kobe Bryant downtown L.A. after winning the national the title and all 45 of them chanting and jumping up and down around me, calling me Uncle Bill. And I looked over there and Paloma and Rose, who were two of the teachers, were sitting there crying. I heard one of them say, I wish I had this on video. And I mean, that was all the confirmation I needed that I'm right where I'm at. Emotionally, I was okay. It didn't make life any easier. We were still struggling financially for a long time. You know, how are we going to keep our house and pay my own mortgage and make sure my kids aren't in the line getting a free meal? Um, but later that night, um, I stood out there. Most of the volunteers had left. It was just me and the food truck in this back lot. And um, I couldn't leave until all the people left so I could lock up because it's Illumination Foundation property they let me use. And I sat over there and I just looked out and there's all these kids in the playground playing and there's all the parents over there and it, it just hit me oh my god 35 40 years from now these kids are still going to be here the difference is going to be that they're going to be the parents over here and it's their kids playing and they're there depending on someone like us to feed them and it was then i finally understood that the concept is saying the cycle of poverty and the only way these children will get out of this cycle is through education yeah. And I mean, there's no other way to get out of it unless you get lucky and win the lottery or you rob a bank or something. Um, and I'm not suggesting you do that. Yeah. Either <laughs> but, one uh, those, yeah. but as then I realized we got to do something, we got to figure out a way to, 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 to train them, to teach them. And we had, to this day, we have tons of volunteers and new one comes in. Here's how you hold the knife to be safe. Here's mm -hmm. how you use the onion and all these things are like, let's do something. And for a long time, I think the video you saw probably had Ethan, and for the longest time, I tried really hard to, to do an ad hoc training program. I mean, I didn't want to run a school. I'm called to feed people. Um, and we had various people come in. Ethan, who's still with us. Caesar is one of the first people we hired and put into culinary training through a homeless uh, program. Um, but during COVID, we realized it's not really working. We got to revamp it. So we built out curriculum. Uh, more than I ever wanted, Charlie and Patty did an amazing job. We got to now... Uh, 18 to 20 week program. We haven't honed it in yet. Um, we did two small classes to really the guinea pigs. Uh, all five of them students graduated. Uh, we started with a few more. We lost some, which is understandable with the population we're serving. But 
Marche Modern is one of the top French restaurants in California in Crystal Cove. One of our students works there. Boss Cat Kitchen is a well-known restaurant. Mm. Um, one of our students works there. Dean Kim, OC Baking, one of our students works for him. Uh, up in Anaheim, maybe even your Belinda area is De Stefano's. One of our students works there, mm. and I don't remember where the fifth one is at. But another restaurant, uh, one of them worked at Vodka for a while, so uh, it, it's working. So now we just started on Monday this week our, our two new classes, a full class of, uh, of sixteen students, one group on Mondays and Wednesdays, one Tuesdays and Thursdays, and. Uh, you know, one of the ironies of it, this class, uh, Ed, is one of the students that we accepted in the program. He walked down the hallway and he saw pictures of us in the food truck. He said, that's my cousin. Oh, my God, you're the people that used to come feed us six or seven years ago at Ross Street House. Hmm. I mean, we Uncle fed Bill? him. And, yeah. yeah. And and he he didn't realize we were the same group of people because there's no food truck around here or nothing. So, uh um, but talk about full circle moment. This kid is so excited. Um, he got one of his uh, uh, friends growing up into the program as well. And, uh, and you know, we work with a lot of agency, amazing agency partners like Orangewood Foundation, like uh, Kids Works, like Stand Up for Kids, uh, Waymakers, um, you name it. And there are kind of our partners in helping these uh, young adults, 18 to 23 year olds through the program. Because we can do the cooking side, but we can't do the case management side. And our goal is not only to obviously to change the pro, uh, pro, uh, the projection of someone's life out of poverty and something more, but also to graduate a generation of chefs that will have compassion to give back and help more people. Well, and not many people get to see, pun, uh, pun intended here, the fruits of their labors. You know, your efforts are certainly, you know, you, you know when you leave and there's people sitting on park benches or school tables eating that you've made a dif difference because you're seeing it with your eyes right there. But to see these kids that might've been the ones that are being fed and now they're being educated and now they're, they have jobs because of what you're doing. That, that's, that's pretty special. I, I applaud you and anybody like you who's, who's making that impact. That's a lasting impact. And, you know, I keep hearing the phrase over and over, you know, you teach a, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And it sounds like that is a driving force behind what you're doing is really teaching these people how to take care of themselves, not just feeding it, them each day. That's the nourishing true. rather yeah. than feeding, I think. Right. Yeah, it, it's true. And that's where we, you know, like I said, we nourish so much more than their body or soul. And I, I just, you know, from a reality standpoint, Ed, um, God shows me those things uh, because he knows I need it. I, I don't have the strength and the courage to sometime to keep forging ahead. It's like, I, I doubt myself. I doubt what we're doing. Are we having the impact? And when a student like that comes in and says, oh my gosh, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it really is powerful uh, in an amazing way. So I found out in two, uh, when I was 25 years old that I wasn't biologically able to have children. And I prayed, God, give me a way that I can be a dad. Give me a way that I can have an influence on the kids. So I love kids. And uh, a few years later, I married a woman who had three kids. I had a niece that wasn't able to be taken care of by her mom. So I adopted her. And now of those four kids, we have eight grandsons and a ninth one on the way. So the moral of the story like yours is be careful what you pray for. Yeah. <laughs> you just might get it. Yeah. 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 God, God wants to hear uh, what you're asking for and you'll be careful how you ask. So as you launch Bracken's Kitchen back in 2013, 14, um, for those that are listening or watching, uh, when we put this podcast up, there may be somebody who has that, that deep burning desire to start something, whether it's a company or a nonprofit, or they have this cause in their heart that they need to do something about. What advice, two-part question, I always tell myself I'm not going to ask two-part questions, but I'm here, <laughs> I am doing it again. What advice would you give to those that were where you were in 2013? That's part one. Part two, what challenges did you face that you didn't expect to face and how did you overcome those? Oh, <sighs> I don't, um, I think the best advice I can ever give people is encouragement uh, because, you know, uh, you know, the, the worst advice ever given is that which isn't asked for it. Yeah, exactly. So while, while you asked for it, no one listening necessarily asked for it. Um, I, um, I, I tried to not um, 
press my faith too much. I never want to offend somebody or drive them away. But I often say I'm a modern day Jonah story. If you know the story of Jonah and the Bible ending up in a big fish. Um, um, I knew God was calling me to this and I ran the other way. I'm, I'm not that brave guy. I mean, uh, the most courageous people in the world are the ones who fear their fear and they face it anyhow. Because courage isn't without fear. It's facing it and stand up to it. Um, and I didn't always do that. It's like I knew I'm I'm being called to go this way and I went the other way. And God just had a way of directing me. And I I, I think thank him every day that he um, brought me to where I am today because I never dreamed it could life could be this good. And I had my own challenges growing up in my childhood and issues that we all have. And mine got the best of me for many years and challenges with relationships in my first marriage that didn't work out and um, and onward. Um, but through it all, I had this, I don't know, this this hole in my heart and soul that I was always trying to uh, to fill. And I tried to fill it through career, through success. And I mean, because I'm a man of faith, um, I believe that we are, we are all created for a purpose and we find ways of, of camping that down and burying it, not worrying about it. But I think deep inside, I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. once said that man's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? Yeah. And, and I, I think we all have that insight in some way. And I, for years, buried mine. I'm facing or chasing fame and fortune, success, diamonds and stars and movie stars and celebrities and cooking in Hawaii and Hong Kong. I've tried everything I can to tamp this down. But I can tell you today, Ed, that Bracken's Kitchen has done more for me than anyone we've ever served and helped. I have been changed at a soul level through the work we do. I mean, I remember on my hands and knees on a dirty street corner in Santa Ana with a rusty old truck beside me crying out to God, why have you brought me here from Beverly Hills to here? And I wouldn't give that up for anything in the world. It was hard going through it, but just the change internally from the inside out. I mean, I mean, the best things in life require a whole lot of work and effort that's just the fact (laughs) nothing good comes easy and but it's just i i I don't even know how to describe it it's the inner peace i have that i get up every day and i'm going to work doing something that really really matters cooking matters i made fancy foie gras and caviar and people ate but there's a whole different level of matter here and um knowing that that i'm doing sorry about that that's Knowing right. that I do something that really matters has changed me. So that's the best encouragement I can give people. I know that this was never going to be Bracken's Kitchen. I didn't want that name on it. This was about me. Uh, Judy Walker, a dear friend of mine who died a few years of cancer, insisted I put my name on it because of my success as a chef in my past life. And I never wanted that. But I now am so grateful that we did that, not for my name to be out there, but there's so many people who knew me in my past life of feeding celebrities and movie stars. And now what are you doing? And it is somehow a a motivation. Hey, if Bill can find something Mm -hmm. more important, meaningful, impactful to do with his life, maybe I can too. So if you're struggling with that, if you're wondering if there isn't something more, then there probably is. And if you're looking for the courage and, and the, the, whatever it takes to get there, just know that when you get there, it'll be so much better for you than it ever was before. So that's my encouragement. The first question, you're going to have to repeat the second one. <laughs> well, just challenge the challenges. challenges. Who, wow. who might have been there as a mentor, if there's anybody you want to name, or obviously your faith. That goes without saying. It goes with saying. I love it because I, too, you know, my faith has gotten me through everything to this point. Uh, are there are there mentors or those out there that you'd like to talk about that helped you through or maybe specific challenges that, that either you saw coming or you didn't see coming at all and you had to overcome? Um, I could talk all day, so I'll try to say a couple important <laughs> things that might help someone and be meaningful and, and not go too long. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm the typical Midwestern guy. My dad was a pull himself up by his bootstraps kind of guy. I'm the guy that could be lost for hours and never ask for directions because men don't ask for directions. <laughs> there you go. Thank God for smartphones now that we never yeah, have to. Yeah, ways is um, the best thing for me. Yeah. yeah, but truly just pulling myself up my bootstraps is a, the, the strongest lesson I learned from my father. So I always somehow learned to just not give up and keep fighting because there's been constant challenges. But 
when I dove in the nonprofit world, I'm like, I know nothing about running a nonprofit. I know how to run a $12 million food and beverage operation at a five-star hotel, but nothing about it. So I had to just reach out to people and find um, um, accountability, accountability partners or mentors, advisors, and people that I could uh, uh, learn from. And I've never been one that's been really good at, let's go have coffee and let me ask you and pick your brain. Um, but I've always been really good at watching and reading and paying attention. Um, I spent two and a half years at the Orange County Rescue Mission. I watched what Jim Palmer did and the way he did it, me and the people there that I'm like, yeah, I mean, this is where you learn from. So a lot of people, nonprofit, I visit a lot of other nonprofits and volunteered here and there. It's like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing uh, on the nonprofit side. So let me watch people. Uh, obviously, God has uh, uh, been a big part of that. We talk about mentors, but honestly, my wife, I remember um, early on, we did one feeding for Bracken's Kitchen. And it happened at the Orange County Rescue Mission before we had Betsy or just as we was getting Betsy. I cooked all this food because I was renting kitchen space there. Um, loaded in warmers in the back of my Ford truck and drove to Anaheim to voice of the refugee. And I did a holiday Christmas dinner, if you will, for 300 Middle Eastern refugees who don't celebrate Christmas. So it was certainly a unique situation. Um, but then a short time later, um, I was asked to leave the kitchen, the rescue mission, not volunteering, but Bracken's kitchen because they brought a new COO in. A lot of people use a the kitchen there, a lot of people. There was not a lot of organization there. So it wasn't, it was a bad thing for me, but it wasn't a bad thing that they did. And I want to clarify that. So sure. it's like, who are all these people using our kitchen over the years? Time to tighten the reins a little bit. I still came there and cooked every, every week volunteering, but no longer. So and here I am with the food truck. Yeah. And I no longer have a kitchen to do preparation. And I remember just being this distraught beside myself. And I remember Molly said to me, he's like, really? You got one small roadblock and now you're ready to quit? What's wrong with you? I love you that. know, and 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 she's not that tough love kind of person at all, but I remember that moment. And uh, and uh, for the next six months, Betsy was parked parallel in our driveway. Hmm. So she went at an angle and a slight angle and she was plugged into her house and I was cooking in Betsy, doing everything, starting to finish washing pots and pans in my driveway in the small sink in the garage, anything at the end of the night and going out and that was my life for six months before I found the kitchen. So, and there was countless roadblocks like that there. And, you know, so again, my dad was just that um, quiet mentor. I watched people, I learned. I mean, uh, when they say uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Yeah. I was like, I want to be tough like my dad. I want to be strong. I don't want to let things uh, get me down. But it's, there was lots of roadblocks. But man, if you know where you're supposed to be, and that moment that I told you about in 2050, when God gave me confirmation, it, it removed all the doubt that I know where I'm supposed to be. So it gives me the power to, to forge ahead. So, um, and that's where faith is. It's important. If you know where you're supposed to be and you're doing what you're supposed to be, if you know you're married to this person you're supposed to be married to, then you fight through the difficulties. If, if you, whatever it is in life, if there's a certain amount of a confirmation and confidence that you're doing what you're supposed to do, where you're at, and it's not a just a wild guess, and it gives you the strength to uh, to, to to fight on, to, to to carry on, and keep doing what you're supposed to do. Problem is, the world is full of a lot of people who, you know, think they're exact doing exactly what's right, but yet they're putting their faith in all the wrong things, and they're listening to all the wrong people. So, it's kind of double double edged sword, if you will, when you talk about that. Or they're doing it for the wrong reason. You know, I've yeah. so many people doing great things. I mean, there's there's people like yourself who are doing great things and doing it for the right reason. And there's other people out there doing great things and maybe for the wrong reason. And at the end of the day, yeah. if you're doing great, that's awesome. But if you couldn't do this through your talents as a, as a cook, as a chef, you'd still be serving people. Have you thought at all about what, where would you serve or how would you serve if it wasn't through food? Um. I sat down with a culinary student recently, just hear a story. Um, not atypical of what I've heard a lot of um, in my last 10, almost 11 years now doing that, born, born to parents who had drug problems. Um, he was removed from his mother uh, with his brother and sister 
when um, she got too abusive and she was eventually deported because she was illegal. Uh, they were left to live with their, they were forced to live with their stepdad. They were temporarily put in foster care then uh, got sent to live with stepdad. Um, his sister was 13 and she was pregnant. Uh, found out that um, that happened in the home. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and they were then permanently removed from their family. And they've been, they was in foster care ever since. As a result, he ended up in drugs and gang life and everything. And he just graduated our program recently, um, is on track to an amazing career and really just turned his life around. And I've seen things that you hear about on, on, on the news or you see stories and movies and things, but you never see happening in real life right in our own backyards. I mean, we talk about human trafficking and we talk about hunger and we hear these things, but we don't really know what it looks like. Um, and for some reason, God has put that all in front of me. And, you know, without a doubt, if I wasn't feeding people, I would be in some way mentoring big brothers and big sisters, CASA, Cordes Boyd and Spe Special Advocates, or something for the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of young people that, through no fault of their own, was born into living hell. And I'm sorry, as we're getting ready to wrap up, I'm talking about something that's so hard. No, no, no it's, you're talking but, from your heart, which is what this is all about. I, I never, I mean, you hear about it, I honestly never would have imagined the hell that some people grow up, young people grow up through. I thought my life was hard growing up and I had my own bed to sleep in every night and, you know, everything was fine. And, you know, student after student has come through this program, we end up hearing about and getting to know them. And it's, it's, it's just terrible that there's so much abuse. So without a doubt, I would be in some way serving the youth and our, and all around us because they're our future. And it's yeah. not just a, a saying, you know, they, will someday grow up to be leaders and the question is what kind of leaders are they going to be and can i have an impact on that well and it, oftentimes we just need to see someone who has things a little bit less fortunate than we do just silly story but my wife and i last week we were down in huntington beach and we have these electronic bikes that we love and we it's nice because you can pedal and get the workout but you can also just put it on yeah EV if you want and, and yeah. for a little while. And we were at the end of our fifth straight day, I think of riding, you know, 15 plus miles and no, nothing huge, but yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I can see the pier in the distance, which is sort of my finish line. Cause we're going to grab a bite to eat there. And I'm at the point where I'm at my wall and my legs are hurting and I just don't feel like pedaling anymore. So I just decided to put it on one and just hit the little throttle thing and cruise on the electric power of the bike because my legs were killing me. And then I looked over and I saw a guy coming my direction in a wheelchair with no legs, pushing and faster in his wheelchair with just his, his hands and I'm going oh. on my bike. And right away it hit me what he would give to have the leg pain that I have right now. Yeah. Put it back to zero and I pedaled the rest of the way. It's, and that story is not about me at all. It's just about perspective. You know, and when we, oh. you know, we see people who don't have it as good as we do, we can, a be very grateful and then b do nothing about it or we can a be very grateful and c do something about it as well and that's uh, I, I truly appreciate that story ed and, and it, it's not even a little story i unfortunately in the world we live in today especially it's so easy to go through life like this here and just worry about ourselves and all of our own problems i mean i posted something on social media the other day that i saw and copied that and it says the weekend coming like this or something and it's a bullet train that just went right by and i mean that's my life i i you joked earlier about my age i turned 60 in three weeks and i never imagined that i would be this busy as i'm turning 60 but i wouldn't trade it for anything in the world because my blinders are off for a long time and mm -hmm. i know that no matter where i am and no how no matter how bad it is all i have to do is look to my left my right and i will see somebody who has it so much worse than me and that's been truly been my guiding star for keeping myself straight when it comes to emotions on my wall over there is a, a paragraph that chuck swindle pastor wrote years ago it's about attitude Love the it. last part of it is i'm convinced that life is 10 percent what happens to me and 90 percent how i respond to it 
we're all in charge of our attitudes because man, it could be so much worse. So uh, if there's nothing more that I can leave people with in the world is like, dude, it could be so much worse. Be grateful for what you got, where you're at, and just truly make the most of it. Yeah, Truly. EV free in Fullerton is where my parents raised me going to church and Swindoll was our pastor. So ah, yeah, uh, he moved uh, to Texas a few years ago yeah, or many I years read, ago now. Yeah. That quote. I like the story of, you know, you go to the doctor and, and you're sick and he, gives you medication and he says, come back and see me in two weeks and we'll see how the medication's working. And when you go back, he gives one of two responses. He says, oh, you're reacting to the medication. Well, that's negative. I'm having a reaction. We need to try a different treatment, a different medication, do something different than what you're doing. If he says you're responding to the medication, it means it's going well, let's keep on this track. And we can react to the world around us and react to the, the poverty and the homelessness and, and, and so forth. And and turn the other cheek or look away or be offended. Or I don't want to, you, you mentioned earlier in this conversation, you know, about, you know, it wasn't about feeding the homeless at first because that kind of scared you a little bit, but responding to it is now doing something about it. So I appreciate that you're, you're responding to your heart and you're responding to the yeah. promptings that you've been given from God and just in your own, in your own mind and your heart and your wife, you know, we both have wives that prompt us a lot. Really? You're going to let that one thing be an obstacle. Come on, <laughs> get over yourself what's a big goal you talked to going into 2020 i got two or three last questions and we'll wrap up here um going into 2020 that goal of of, of 600 000 meals and obviously going three times that um sitting here july of 20 by the way you're you're a lot older than i am you've got me by nine months i'll be 60 <laughs> so i i can I, I can hear what you're talking about there so i know you got that big 60 coming and 60 is the new 40 right we're the golden boys <laughs> You know, all right. Charles like and Wayne, we're all we're all the golden boys now, so that's all good. Uh, not to give away their ages, but they're they're older than you and I are, so that's good. <laughs> Goals that you have for Bracken's Kitchen going forward, what would you, whether it's a number or just a, an impact, or when you think about, you know, either A, I'm done and I'm hanging it up, or B, just what's the next big thing I want to reach? What What do you think of? Well, God ain't gonna let me be done anytime soon. That I know, Ed. No but um, one thing we realized in the last couple of years, I mean, remember 2020, we pivoted and we just ramped up and we changed and we um, we grew and we did all these things. We took over the building next door. Now we got 18,000 square feet now total. Wow, which makes our big event coming up fun. There's more space, but um, but we realized both conceptually and operationally what we do here works. Every major metropolitan community in America has the three things in common as it pertains to what we do. They have food waste, they have poverty, and they have hunger. And we rescue food. We train students that, that food that the students prepare and train and practice on, on, on top of everything else we do here goes to feeding people. And they all work together. And uh, as you now know how old I am, mm -hmm. uh, you know that I'm too tired and I've had my 15 minutes of fame and all that stuff. I don't dream of having a Bracken's Kitchen in every community in America, but every community in America needs a Bracken's Kitchen type of model. That's something someone else told me on many occasions. So our goal right now is truly to perfect our systems. Our warehouse that we took over a little over a year ago is now completely built out. It's been approved by the health department. We got a full packaging team there. We're going to bring in some automation to it. We really want to perfect everything and box it up so that we can share with others, whether we're consulting someone to open a similar program, whether we're uh, franchising out and people can open their own rescued food kitchen, if you will, under our umbrella, whatever it looks like. Again, it isn't about me. It's about how we can rescue more food, feed more people and train more students and give them a path out of poverty, not just here, but everywhere because the need is there. Yeah. How can people get in touch with you if they want to get involved? So two part, um, here's my two part question. How do they reach you? you know, <laughs> two of those, two two part yeah, questions. Yeah, two, two parters. <laughs> you talked about social media, best way for people to reach you um, if they just want to get involved or they want to find out where you're going to be and come and volunteer. I've seen on your social and I've talked to others I know personally who have gone into the kitchen there and I'm still going to do my tour and come in, by the way, we got to get that scheduled. You're welcome. Anytime How do they ready. get involved? What, what is involvement? The best kind of involvement is what, and then how can people reach you to do so? And then I'll ask you my final question. Well, I mean, first of all, when you talk about involvement, I remind people all the time that we run a business just like anybody else. 
And everything it takes to run a for-profit business, we need for a nonprofit business, everything. There's no different. We are a business. We happen to have to file things differently with the government. We have to manage our money differently. We have to impact the community in a positive way. That's what makes a nonprofit. So when it comes to people getting involved, you got a skill, we can put it to use. You know how to repair things? I'd rather get a volunteer to come out and jump on our roof and work on our refrigerator than pace a company. Um, so volunteering, whatever it is, obviously our website, like the world today, www.brackenskitchen.org. Go there. There's volunteer links. There's everything. Um, uh, you know, we talk a lot in the nonprofit world, as you know, time, talent, and treasure. Mm -hmm. I got some friends that actually give all of them supporters. Some, I don't have a lot of time, but I have lots of treasure. I'll give you that. Others, I don't have a lot of treasure, but I have some talent. I'll help you and guide you and advise you. And then again, some people just giving time, whatever it is, just to yeah. come out and peel onions all day. So it really, I used that word earlier, but it really does take a village. And um, I mean, we have anywhere from eight to 20 volunteers in the kitchen on any given day on top of our now 30 employees. I mean, that's our goal this year, 2 million meals, mm -hmm. rescue 300,000 uh, uh pounds, 300 tons of food, 600,000 pounds, I'm sorry, of food diverting it from the landfill and of course training students. So um, any way you want to get involved, you can. And even if you don't come here, even if it's just sharing on social media, you know, I'm going to do, I, I don't do this often. I haven't done it in a few years, but I'm going to do a Facebook fundraiser for my birthday. I got 5,000 friends, give or take on Facebook. If I just get a thousand of them, which is give or take 20% to give $60 in honor of a 60th birthday, you know, for those who can, that's $60,000. That'll impact. put it. Yeah. And I'll put an entire class through culinary training. 16 students will be trained, you know? So, I mean, it, it really doesn't take, you know, at all. Mother Teresa once said that I know that I am but a drop in the ocean, but somehow that ocean would be less if I weren't there. People seem to think that they always have to go big or go home. Every little bit makes a difference. Every dollar donated, every hour volunteered. Somebody likes a post on social, they share it, they comment on it, changes algorithms. Do what you can where you're at for whoever it is. I mean, you may not be able to do it all. You may, be, may not be able to change the world, but you can have impact wherever you're at from your living room, just sharing a little love on social or whatever it is. So. I just can't express that enough to people. You, I don't know if you watch my Monday Minutes ad, but it's every Monday I do a little thing. And I talked about that a few weeks about going, going big or going home. I mean, do what you can where you're at with what you got, no matter what it is. And you will change, help change the world. Yeah. Heard a story of a bunch of men trying to move a piano and they were trying to figure out the best way to move the piano. And there were 10 of them around it. And finally, one person just said, stand where you are right now and lift. And the next thing I knew, they'd lifted the piano. So if we just yeah. are, are where we are and we stand there and we lift, we'll make yeah. a big impact. So as as you know, the name of the podcast is From the Heart. You've been staring at my name on the screen at heart. You know, you, you know, we know each other a bit, so you know my last name. Podcast is called that for a couple of reasons. A, obviously, the last name. You know, I wouldn't. it wouldn't be From the Heart if my last name was Smith, probably. But uh, oh, maybe it would from be. From the Smith. <laughs> from the Smith. There you go. But the main focus is really, you know, because, you know, I can, I can look at your LinkedIn and follow you on social, which I do and, and know what you do. Uh, and you just spent the last hour answering this question anyway, but I'm going to give you one last chance to package it up and just answer this question. Bill Bracken, what's in your heart? I, um, I'll get emotional here now. I have a deep, deep need to know that when I die, that it truly mattered that I lived. Not just for my wife, for my kids, but for the world. That it truly matters that I've been on this earth, that I've made a difference in someone's life. And if more people could grasp that, because it matters that every one of us lives, we all matter. No matter who you are, where you're at, no matter what you're going through, no matter what obstacles you face, no matter what mountain you think you can't overcome, it matters that you live. And if we all can grasp that and make the most of the time that God gives us, this world would be so much better. 
not that it's going to happen anytime soon. It's 30 or 40 years down the road, hopefully, but there will be a day when the Honda Center is filled for Bill Bracken's life celebration, and I can hear 18,000 people chanting, Uncle Bill, Uncle <laughs> Bill. <laughs> You're too kind. <laughs> You got me emotional there now. Sorry. You're making a massive impact, brother. I'm uh, honored to know you, honored to be your friend. Look forward to saying yes to that invitation to your home for dinner as soon as I possibly can. And uh, just to give you a big hug. You're, uh, in the short period of time I've known you, you've quickly become one of my favorites. And uh, this interview has been one of my favorites as well. I just I appreciate you sharing your heart and what you're doing and the impact that you're making. And um, I just God bless you for the man you are and the impact that you're making and the, and the, the, uh, the people you're feeding, not just with food, but, uh, with things much more important than food. So thank you. And trust me, the feeling is very mutual. It's been a true pleasure to get to know you and be here. Thank you for giving, giving me this time. So barbecue soon. Okay. <laughs> 10 four.